If you're excited about Jesus Christ, let me hear you say, hey, praise God, amen. We're a Christ-centered organization, and we want to see lives change. And we know that the gospel of Jesus Christ is where life change happens. Reaching the heart to reach with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We want to see you raise your kids in the church house and not the dope house. Amen. 1 Kings 18. The title of the sermon is Challenge Accepted. Challenge Accepted. How many in here have said that before? I dare you, right? Okay, what is it? I, I got some, uh, some Carolina Reapers and some ghost peppers at my house. And uh, I was dying to see somebody eat one of them Carolina Reapers, man. And I had somebody come over to my house, and I cut a piece of one off. It, was, it wasn't even a Carolina Reaper. It was a ghost pepper. And uh, I watched the sweat just come down his face as he's staring at me. Uh, anyways, I don't know why I said that. But I want to say thank you to our volunteers that come to help. First Baptist Republic serving food tonight. Thank you for that help. <laughs> Boulevard Baptist and River of Life from Monette, Missouri. Thank you guys for coming and helping us. 1 Kings 18, I've been so excited to preach this sermon. 1 Kings 18, challenge accepted. 18, 1 Kings 18, we're going to start in verse 17. Then it happened. It's always special when that goes on in the Bible. When Ahab saw Elijah... That Ahab said to him, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? And Elijah answered, I have not troubled, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, and that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and followed Baals. Now therefore, send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel, four hundred and fifty prophets of Baal, and four hundred four hundred prophets of Asherah, who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent for all the children of Israel, gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel, and Elijah, and Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. And, and they, they answered him not a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left, a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Therefore, let them give us two bulls. Let them choose one bull for themselves, cut it in pieces, and lay it on the wood. But no fire under it. And I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood. And no fire under it. And you call on the name of your gods, and I'll call on the name of my of the Lord and of the Lord, and the God who answers by fire, he is God. And so all the people answered and said, It is well spoken. And Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose your bull for yourselves, prepare it first, for you are many, and call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. So they took the bull which was given to them, and they prepared it, and they called on the name of Baal. Listen to this. From morning till noon, saying, Oh, oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice. No one answered. They leaped about on the altar. They leaped about the altar, which they'd made. So it was noon. And Elijah mocked them and said, Cry out. He's a god. Either he's meditating, or he's busy, or he's on a journey. Perhaps he's sleeping and you got to wake him up. <laughs> so they cried louder and cut themselves, as was their custom, with knives and lances until blush gushed out of them. And it was midday past the pro and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the first sacrifice, which was 3 o'clock. That's my words, not the Bible. That's the evening sacrifice, 3 o'clock. But there was no voice and no one answered or paid attention. Then Elijah called to all the people, come near to me. And all the people came near to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord, which was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of tribes of the sons of Jacob, who were, who were the word of the Lord had come, and in, in, saying, Israel be your name. 
And he built an altar in the name of the Lord, which he had made in the trenches all about the altar, uh, which hold two seas of seed. And then he put the wood on the, in order, put the bulls in pieces. He laid the wood and filled the water with the pots and poured the water on it. And he said, do it a second time and a third time. So eventually what happens, this is my word, not the Bible, is God sends fire down. God answers by fire. And when he sends fire down, all the water's licked up. And they knew who God was. And then he said, seize the prophets of Baal. And they seized the prophets of Baal and they ran a sword through each one of them. And all of them died. Elijah's facing the biggest fight of his life. What he's been trained for. He's traveling all alone. He faces the king of Ahab, King Ahab of Israel. God sends him to the brook of Cherish. There he is at the brook. He's fed for by the ravens in that season of his life for about a year and a half. And the brook dries up. He has no money. He has no soldiers. He has no army. All he has is faith in God. And then he goes from that place to the widow of Zarephath. Walking by faith. Taking the directions God gives him. He stays at the widow's house. He's fed by flour and oil that doesn't run out of a jar. This widow's dying. She has a little bit left. He says, you give me that first and you'll never run out. She never ran out. Her son dies. God raises him from the dead. So God prepares Elijah each season of his life for the fight of his life. And here he is. He's believing God can do miraculous things because this brother's been riding on a miracle for three and a half years. Amen. And, and so here he's facing these prophets. He runs into a man named Obadiah. Obadiah is a secret believer in, in, in the God of Israel. He's a governor of the palace. He's hiding the prophets of God in caves 50 at a time. Ahab and his, his cohort, his wife Jezebel, who wore the pants, she's slaughtering the prophets of God. Obadiah says this, he says, don't you know that every kingdom, everywhere, has a, he has a hit list. On, hit, you're, you're wanted. He wants to kill you. Uh, Elijah says, tell him to come on. Bring 450 prophets of Baal. Bring 400 prophets of Asherah. Uh, bring Ahab. Bring all the people right here to Mount Carmel and we'll see who God really is. Ahab meets and addresses Elijah as the troublemaker. Elijah confronts the king three and a half years after Elijah said it's not going to rain but by my word. It hadn't rained. It's been the worst drought in history. Elijah's outnumbered. He has been placed in a position that only the God of the universe can get him out of. Listen, let me tell you something. When you're walking by faith and you're seeing God move in your life, sometimes God will put you in a position that only he can get you out of. Why? So he can show you how awesome he is, so he can show off with your life, so he can show the power of God on you. That's why he does that stuff. And, and, and so Elijah's walking by faith. He's all alone. He knows if, if, if the king has his way, he's dead. But he, but he believes God. He's facing the challenge of his life. Let me ask you a question tonight. What are some of the challenges you, you're facing? What are the, the challenges that you have faced? Think of the things that God has done in your life since you received Jesus Christ as your Lord. I look back at my life and... And I look back since I got saved in 2008 in a prison cell, in a hot cell in Fulton, Missouri. So hot you could peel the paint off the walls in that joker, right? Sweating. And I see what God did, get, did there and what God's brought me through. And I look back and sometimes I think to myself, I don't know how, 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 how I got through that. And I'm just being honest. I know God did it. That's the answer. But still, I think, man, could I do that today? God gave me special grace at a time in my life and built me up and allowed me to go through those things so he could give me the faith to believe him to do impossible things. Like what? What kind of possible things? Like buying a 37,000 square foot uh, building with a bad roof and mold and water and mildew with needing $1 million to renovate that thing and not having one penny to do it with. Whoa, that's what God does. How? I don't know. God does. How can we do it? God can do it. We believe God. We walk by faith. The challenge Elijah made towards the prophets, they claimed their God was Baal, the God of the thunder. 
the God who rode the lightning according to the Can Canaanite mythology. He was the one in charge of the rain and fertility. Uh, God stopped the rain to show the people who really was in charge. God stopped the rain to show the people who really made the rain, who really rode the lightning, who really made things fertile. That's why all this had happened. So I want you to get into the scene. I'm going to put you there for a minute. Let's think about this. Elijah has fire in his eyes. Can you see him tonight? He, he, he's wearing camel hair, and he's a wild man. And there he is all alone. He believes God can do mighty things. He's walking by faith. He's riding on miracles. And, and so here's Elijah, and he faces 450 prophets of Baal. He faces the king of Israel, hundreds, maybe thousands of Israelite bystanders who are riding the fence. Elijah calls all them out. Elijah, Elijah allows the prophets of Baal to go first, and they can't get the job done. He's saying, listen, it's one of me, and there's 450 of you. How come your God isn't answering? Maybe you need to get a little louder. He, he begins to taunt them and mock them. They're cutting, they're praying, they're chanting, they're working themselves to death, and God's not moving at all. Then Elijah calls on his God, and God answers by fire. By the end of the day, everyone know who, knows who's God really is God and who really controls the lightning who really controls the rain so the first point I want to make tonight is this the Lord challenges the religious establishment here in the scripture the Lord challenges the, the religious establishment through Elijah notice Elijah calls out two popular gods Asherah Baal if you look into Canaanite, the Canaanite religion, if you look back into the Middle East, when Middle Eastern times when this was going on, you'll see that Ashtoreth was married to a god in their idea named El, E-L. El had 70 children. Baal was one of the baby gods they had. Baal and Ashtoreth were the two most famous. Ashtoreth was a goddess, the mother of Baal, and Baal was her son. His father was supposed to be El, El, and Ashtoreth. And him and her were, were given credit for the rain. And Baal was the one that was supposed to ride the lightning. And, and so he, he's calling them out. He's saying, listen, there ain't no such thing. Just like Jeremiah chapter 10, you read that chapter. Jeremiah talks about idols are nothing. They have to nail them down so they don't fall over. Right? They're nothing. And, and so Elijah calls them out. And, and tonight you may say, preacher, we don't have Asherah. We don't have El. We don't have Baal. And and this is, this is a different time, and I'm telling you tonight, here at Freeway Ministries, here at Freeway Ministries, we do recovery through the Bible of Jesus, the Bible, and the, and the cross, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we challenge the religious establishment, we challenge the idea of recovery every single time, because we say there is only one way through Jesus Christ, there's only one way to be free. The idea of making a God into your image goes all the way back to Baal, goes all the way back to Al, goes all the way back to Ashtoreth. See, many people want their God to be in their image. We challenge that tonight. I'm not, I love you in Jesus Christ, and I'm telling you this as your friend, and, and with a broken heart as, as a shepherd. But I'm telling you, my, my, I would not be worth my salt if I did not tell you that your way does not work because you are messed up and you need Jesus Christ in your life to save you and raise you and give you true peace from God. And it's only going to come through Jesus Christ. There's no peace without Jesus, brother. And, and, and so they made this God in the image of man instead of being man in the image of God. That's what Elijah was challenging. Today, people want God to be like them, a God of their own understanding. God of, God of your own understanding in the Bible got you run through with a sword. Listen, God doesn't have to be like you, and you don't have to figure him out or understand him in order for him to be God. And you may not believe in God, and you may say it with your lips, but in your heart you know he's real. There wouldn't be no atheist if there wasn't a God. See, you don't have to believe in a shotgun to get your head blown off. And, 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 and so, I'm telling you tonight, listen to me. Elijah taunts Baal. Elijah taunts them. Elijah taunts them. And, and, and look, look, look what he says. 
the, the, the people shaped their idols and carved them in woods to look just like them of their own understanding. And maybe I'm not doing a good job of communicating this, so let me give you another way to think about this, okay? How many in here have been to Build-A-Bear? I love Build-A-Bear. I, I, lo I like that place. I go there three times a year. Three times a year I go to Build-A-Bear. I visit, I visit there and I'll have a little, little kid or two with me. And, uh, and you go in this place... And, and it's called build a bear, but it's build a whatever you want, amen? And, and so you go in this place, and they got every stuffed animal you could imagine. They got dinosaurs, every color you can think of. They got teddy bears. They got superheroes. They got Pokemon, right? Pokemon is there. They got horses there. They got, they got, uh, they got everything you think of. They got cats there. They got puppies there. They got dragons there. They got all kinds of stuff there, man. You can. You can put roller skates on them and walk them around. Uh, you can buy them clothing. You can dress them up. You can put heartbeats in them and push on their chest and hear their heart beating. You can put all kinds of sounds in them and put them in their hands and then squeeze them and they roar and they bark and they make all kinds of noise. And at the end of your Build-A-Bear experience, your bank account will be lower, <laughs> right? Every time I go there, my bank account's lower. And you'll have a birth certificate. With the name of your bear on it, whatever you want to name them. See? Listen to me. A lot of people want their God like Build-A-Bear. See? You pick one out to think like you think. Be okay with your sin. Do what you want to do to make you comfortable with whatever you want to do, right? You don't want God. You want Build-A-Bear. Listen to me. Let me tell you something about, about truth. Once you know something's true and you admit something's true, you have to surrender to it. Or you have to willingly deny it. The greatest scandal in the history of our world is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You cannot deny Jesus. Let me tell you what you can do. You can spit on him. You can mock him. You can make fun of him. You can ridicule him. You can say he doesn't exist. Or you can love him and surrender to him. But here's one thing you can't do. You can't ignore Jesus. So you have to make a decision on what you're going to do with Jesus Christ. And these people made God like Build-A-Bear. They, they wanted God to be in their image. Do you, know, you want to know why so many people struggle with, with your relationship with God? I'm just going to be honest with you. The reason you struggle in your relationship with God is because your God's just like you. That's why you struggle. That's why you struggle. You struggle with God because God's like you. Your God's like you. And if my God was like me, we would all be in trouble, amen? Everybody. I'd struck a lot of people dead today, amen? Right? I'm just being honest. I'm a, I'm a man with has sin issues, and, and I've, I got flesh, and I struggle with flesh just like everybody else. And some of you need to adjust your crooked halo because you're looking at me like, I can't believe he said that. I just said the truth your preacher won't say. Listen. <clears throat> God is not like you. God is not like me. He's God. He has no beginning. He has no end. He's the creator. He speaks things into existence as if they were, but they weren't. See, listen to me. I wrote this down. My God doesn't get tired or weary. My God doesn't take a vacation. My God does not need a break. My God has never had a problem. My God is eternal. eternal. My God is everlasting. He has no creator. Wrap your mind about, around that. Because he is the great I am. I can trust him. Listen, I do not need to work my way to heaven because he came down and did the work for me. And at the end of the day, he said, it is finished. He is omnipotent, omniscience, all-knowing, all-powerful. He's the creator God. Listen to me. Why, why do you think your prayer life struggles so much? Because you pray to a God who's just like you. You've limited him. You've tied his hands because of your lack of faith. You're praying like God's surprised with your problem. You're walking with God like he's surprised with the situation in your life. God's not caught off guard. God's not surprised. God can be trusted. So pray that way. Believe that way. Have great big faith in an almighty God that can do all things. How big is your God? How big is he? 
He's the God who raised me from a prison cell. He's the God who took me from a homeless shelter with nothing but some hand-me-down clothes and some shoes that said pookie on them. That's how big my God is. I know who God is. I know what God can do. I'll have church all by myself up here with nobody else. I don't care because my God is worthy. Your prayers are only as big as your God. Let me say that again. Your prayers are only as big as your God is. These false prophets had a God who was limited because their God was made with limitations. Like them. Let me say that again. These people had a God who was limited because their God was made with limitations. Like them. They carried him around. They put him up on stands. They had to nail him down so he didn't fall over. He was carved into their image. That's why their God had limitations. Listen to me. He's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is eternal and he knows all things. And when you get your mind wrapped around that and you know all things work together for the good of those that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose, your faith will change, your belief will change, your stress will change, everything will change in your life. When you wrap your mind around a God who has never had a problem, a God who can solve all things because he is all things, an eternal God that knew you would sit in the seat you're sitting in before your mama was born. That's the God I pray to. That's the God I trust. See? He's not limited like you and me. And you can see this in the way Elijah taunts the people. Look what he says. Maybe your God's in deep thought and he can't hear. Why would he say that? Because the God they worshipped was limited because the God they worshipped was like them. We're the ones that get in deep thought and can't hear, amen? I get distracted all the time. My wife's like, are you listening to me? I'm looking at her right in the eye thinking about what I'm going to eat for breakfast tomorrow, right? (laughs) Maybe he's on a break. Maybe your God's on a break. The literal translation, and you proved me wrong and looked this up, when he says that is he's using the bathroom. Maybe your God had to go to the bathroom. What else did he say? Maybe he's on a long journey and he can't be reached right now. Because the God they worshipped was, 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 was not in every place all the time like our God. The Phoenicians, the Phoenicians that, that, that were of this day, they believed that Baal traveled with them on journeys when they traveled the ocean. And so he was taking a crack at that theology. Maybe your God's asleep and he didn't set his alarm. You need to wake him up. Get a little louder, right? And, 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 and the, the idea behind what Elijah was saying, please don't miss this is they made a God of their own understanding. And making a God of your own understanding is not biblical. A God of your own understanding. Listen, what what you think God says and what you believe God says and what what this person says, listen, I don't want to know what you think he said. I don't want to know what you might think or believe. I want to know what God's Word says because that's what I'm interested in. What God's Word says. I want to do what it says. I want to obey what it says. I want to stand against the things God stands against. And I want to get in the middle of the blessing of the obedience of God Almighty. And I have to find it through His Word. And and so that's who I'm interested in. And listen, God gets in my business. His Word makes me feel convicted. I mean, last night I had to apologize. My my son, I got upset with my son. It's the hardest thing in my life is parenting a 10-year-old boy. You know what? I told him, I'm just going to be, be honest. Don't you tell him I said this. No, I'm not going to say it. <laughs> You'll tell him. No, no. I, anyways, I was, I was rude. I was rude to my son. And I was wrong. And a lot of times I do stuff like that and I have to apologize. My Bible says don't suffer your children to wrath. Don't do that. Don't be rude to them. They're people too. Respect your children. And when, you, and when you do something that's out of line, you need to go back and you need to apologize for it because they're people too, amen? And, and why am I saying this? I'm telling you that because that's what God's Word says. That's my struggle, guys. This isn't from me. This isn't the preacher. This is the Bible. And, and so that's the, the idea here. So the religious establishment is a challenge. 
uh, making God in the image of man instead of making man in the image of God. That's part of that religious establishment he was challenging. And the second thing he was challenging here in the same point is this, the idea of works. The idea of works. Every religion known to man is working your way to heaven. Every religious, every religion, even Buddhism. You say, no, it's not preacher. There is no theology in Buddhism. It's the inner self, searching for the inner self. Yeah, but it still works. It still all works. And, 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 and so uh, the incorrect view of God is a work, works-based theology. Always trying to earn favor. Always trying to do good works. Uh, they were working themselves to death. What were they doing? Trying to get Baal's attention. Shouting, hollering, uh, getting loud, dancing around, putting on a big show with a lot of people do even in this room. And, and, and so they were, they, were, they were getting attention. They were trying to be loud. Uh, they were frantic. They were hopping up and down over and over and over and over and over and over again. Making a bunch of noise. The word noise, it means ranting and raving in the Hebrew. Literally. They were ranting and raving. They were getting very loud. No power from God. See, today I see the same problem from those who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ. They work themselves to death just like these cults, cults did. You try to earn favor from God that only comes by grace. Has your, has, has your dad ever given you a Christmas present and said, okay, now you can't have it until you mow the grass? No. It's a gift. It's a gift. You try to earn favor that comes by grace. These people were putting on a show to get God's attention. Sometimes folks come and they, put, they, they try to earn favor with God. They try to do things to, to earn favor and get God's attention. Some may be hopping up and down. Some may be falling on the floor. Some may have an emotional experience and claim it was from God with no real power. Let me tell you something tonight. If, you're, if your worship looks like Hindu worship, I think your worship has a God problem. I'm just telling you right now. Listen, I don't have to. I get emotional. I love God. I get excited. I don't see how preachers can preach sitting down. And I don't see how preachers can preach standing in one place. Because that's how God made me. And I've seen anointed preachers sit down and preach and it's good and God made them that way I just don't understand it my point is this I'm not getting excited because I'm trying to get God's attention I'm not shouting because I think if I sh the louder I shout then I'll get his if I shout louder than Eric and get God's attention then I can boast in my shouting right I'm shouting and I'm getting excited because God saved me God raised me up God changed my life and I think that's something to be excited about but I'm not doing it with the wrong motivation See, this is what Piper says, John Piper, listen to this. To love God does not mean to meet his needs, but rather to delight in him and be captivated by his glorious power and grace and to value him above all other things on this earth. All the rest of the commandments are the kinds of things that we do from our hearts if our hearts are truly delighted with the resting in the and resting in the glorious grace of God, see a lot. Uh, John Piper saying all the things that come from me are out of a love for God. All the things that I do, all the time, all the other works, whatever they are, is because God. I love God so much. I want to do them out of a love, not out of a works-based idea that I'm earning extra grace or extra favor from God. Because here's the deal: your best ten minutes won't get you to heaven, buddy. I'm telling you right now, you're not good enough on your own. The Bible says that we're saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. It is a gift from God, right? The Bible says that very clearly, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. And so the Bible says that we're not saved by works. Why? Because God takes the boasting away. If we could boast, we will because we are prideful. All of you are prideful. I am prideful. We struggle with that. So what's God do? He takes the boasting away. He sent Jesus Christ to live a sinless life. God in the flesh. Philippians 2 came down and lived among us. He stepped down from his glory and, and he took on an earth suit. He didn't choose to live in the White House. He didn't choose to be a, a king uh, on this earth. No, he, cho he chose to be a poor 
He was homeless. He, had, he said foxes have uh, holes and birds, have, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He chose the most humble uh, outfit he could. He put that thing on. He lived a sinless life. He went to the cross. He was spoken of all through the Old Testament. The one, the Messiah who would come and rule and reign. He died on a cross. Let me tell you something. John 1.1 1, 1 says Jesus Christ is the creator. Listen to this. John 1.1. 1, 1. It says in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God, right? In the beginning. Genesis 1.1. 1, 1, in the beginning. In the beginning God. Gen uh, John 1.1. 1, 1, in the beginning God. Jesus Christ's word. The word came flesh and it dwelt among us. Now listen to this. Five days Jesus Christ was was uh was was questioned the sixth day he finished his work and said it is finished the seventh day on the cross he went into the tomb and he rested how many days did it take god to create the world six what did he do on the seventh he rested see jesus christ came and he lived and he died and he rose again because he made a perfect way for us to enter into heaven where nobody can boast the most vile wicked junkie in this room can be ushered into the kingdom and have a fine linen and be put on purple uh king's clothing and can go to heaven tonight and be saved from your sin it doesn't matter where you're at it doesn't matter what background you come from and in my opinion the more messed up you got the more god can use you for his glory <laughs> don't trust in your works tonight don't trust in your goodness some of you folks in here need to be saved from your self-righteousness because you're so good you've never been lost but you got to be lost to be saved you have to recognize that you're just as much a filthy no good sinner as the person down there that's shooting people and shooting dope and robbing liquor stores in God's eyes, you are the same. Sin is sin. Your best works is filthy rags in God's eyes. So, we're, we're discussing the concept of, of um, Elijah challenging the, re the religious establishment, right? And, and so, Elijah is challenging the religious establishment. Elijah is tra challenging uh, somebody who could kill him like that, right? Uh, Ahab's wife, Jezebel was slaughtering the prophets. If you read earlier in chapter 18, you'll see that um, Obadiah was hiding them 52 a cave, and he said that uh, the Jezebel had been killing them and slaughtering them. And so he's standing there, and he's challenging the religious establishment and how God is made in the image of man instead of man being the image of God. And then he challenges the idea of works. He's like, get louder, get louder, you know. And, and, and the idea that their God is just, it's just a wooden image it doesn't mean anything. And, and so we're talking about worship and works and why we do what we do, you know. A am I earning favor? Am I, am I always under some kind of, am I thinking I need to do this to please God and do that to please God? Yes, we please God by obeying the things that he says are good and the things that are dear to his heart, his commandments. Yes, that's what we need to be doing tonight. But I'm not doing it to earn favor. I'm doing it because I love him and I want to please him because of what he did for me. Does that make sense? So some in this room are living, living in a works-based theology. You're always afraid you're going to lose your salvation. Or maybe, you, maybe you're, you were saved last week and now you need to get saved again because you did something bad. Um, but I'm going to ask you a question tonight. Did Jesus give his life and pay for your sins? How many of them? What you think about that? Past, present, future. Je Jesus, Je listen to me. He paid for all of it. Your salvation doesn't depend on you. It never has. Your salvation is, is dependent on Jesus Christ and that empty tomb and that resurrection and what he did for us on the cross. And, and so when, when Christ saved you, he saved you and he promised you eternal life, present tense. Look in the Bible and see all through the Bible where it talks about those who believe have it. So you, you believe in Jesus. You believe he died and he rose again. You have to eternal life. Present tense right then. You get it. It's mine right now. It's not you'll get it later. It's no, you have it now. And so today I stand in front of you and I possess eternal life because of what Jesus Christ did for me. 
because of the work he did on the cross, he said it's finished, the last sacrifice for our sins. So I'm not going to try to work myself to heaven. I'm going to rejoice in the fact that heaven is my home, that earth is, earth is just a temporary place, that this old breaky, achy body is just a rental, and one day I'm moving in to the permanent house in heaven, amen? One day I'll have a celestial body. I'll be made like him, I'll see him as he is, the Bible says in 1 John. So please listen to me. The, regardless of the thoughts you have on, 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 on theology tonight, you're saved in what you have, you have by grace. You're saved because of grace, no matter what your position is. Brother, if you're a mopper, if you're a van driver, if you're a Sunday school teacher, if you're a preacher, if you're an evangelist, the position you have is only because of an undeserved merit and favor from God, the grace of God. The gifts you have and the talents you have are by grace. The love you, your, your Father loves you so much, He sent Jesus Christ so you can have an inheritance by the sacrifice that he made. And nothing else you have is from your own in Christ. It's all. Listen, the home you have is a gift from God. The breath you have, you got from God. The family you have is a gift from God. Uh, wherever God's put you is because of his gift, his gift of grace. And so, if you see the way Elijah prays and cries out to God, and you see the way the false prophets pray, uh, there's, there's a really big difference. Elijah just prays, and you can check it out for yourself. In verse 36 and 37, he prayed that the Lord would gain glory and that the people would know the authority of God's word. Elijah didn't put on a show. Elijah didn't try to attract a bunch of attention to himself, but he was focused all on God getting the glory. And, and the second point I want to make from this sermon is this. Elijah challenged the evidence. Elijah challenged their evidence. When I look at the scripture here, I see that he challenged it. He said, let's see your God respond, and we'll see if my God responds, and whoever responds is God. And, and so, uh, Elijah challenged the false prophets to produce evidence in the sight of all the people. He waited all day for them to get the attention of their God, and they couldn't do it. Nothing happened. And then Elijah called on his God, and his God responded by fire. Tonight, we're living in the New Testament, church age, right now. Uh, God's word is written before us. We have it evidence. We have from first to beginning. We have we have the Genesis to Revelation. We have the whole entire Bible penned and canoned. Um, right now, we have the evidence that God is alive. And you may say, "Well, let me let me see the evidence, preacher. Is it a book written by men? No, it's not. It's sixty-six books written through history by people who never even knew each other, and it fits together like a perfect puzzle. But that's not the evidence I have for you tonight. The evidence that I have tonight is changed lives." Change lives. You can't deny a changed life. You can't deny when somebody gets, when God gets in the heart of a man or a woman, takes a filthy, filthy vile, troublemaking sinner and saves them and gives them a new heart, gives them a new love, gives them a new thirst and a hunger for things they never had before. You can't deny it. Think about it. God, God sent signs and wonders to the people of his day, and signs and wonders never made anyone believe anything. Signs and wonders came to the Pharaoh, 12 plagues. Moses came to him with a stick and a stuttering brother and, and, and said, hey, we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to take the most powerful man in the world on. And God sent sign after sign after sign after sign after sign, and the Pharaoh didn't believe. And then Jesus comes. And, and, and he, he does signs and wonders to bring authority to his word. We didn't have the written canon then. We have it now. And he did signs and wonders then. And they had a hard heart and they did not believe in him because of it. And look what it says in Matthew 16, 1 through 4. I'm going to read it to you. Jesus told them that a wicked and perverted generation seeks signs, but none would be given except for the sign of Jonah. Well, Jonah went into the veil. Well, the, the belly's whale, the whale of the belly, uh, whatever, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> the fish, the fish's belly. He went in it, didn't he? And what happened? He came out of it. And, and, and Jesus said, no sign will be given except for the sign of Jonah. What happened? Jesus went in the tomb. Three days later, Jesus came out of the tomb. Listen, unbelievers, atheists, and people who, who, who fight against the fact that Jesus Christ 
was God in the flesh. He died on a cross and he rose again. Today are still looking for the body of Jesus Christ and they can't find him and they won't find him because he sits at the right hand of the Father in heaven. He's risen from the grave. How, how many have seen someone set free from bondage because of atheism? You bring me 10 people in this room and line them up here and say their marriage was in trouble and they were headed for divorce, but they got atheism and changed everything. It don't happen. It doesn't happen. It, it, it doesn't work. We have biblical proof and evidence of the power of God we serve, friends, right here in this room. We have ex-junkies, ex-junkies that were called into ministry. We have ex-prostitutes that are now Sunday school teachers. We have ex-street thugs working security, amen. We, we have ex-drug ex dealers turning into evangelists. We have ex-getaway drivers driving people to church on Sunday morning. Woo! What do you think that is? That's the evidence of the power of God. Sending missionaries all over the world to plant freeway ministries that come from our background. That's the evidence of God. I was talking to my nephew Keith on the phone. He was in a federal prison at the time. And I'd share Christ with him and share my faith with him and what God's doing in my life because when he knew me, I was homeless and I was on the streets of Jeff City, Missouri, and I was a wretched mess. Couldn't be trusted with $5. And, uh, and, and he said, Uncle John, he said, they try to tell me how Jesus is just a teacher. They try to tell me how he really didn't die on the cross and the disciples stole his body. They try to tell me they adopted the Canaanite mythology of the Bible. That's where it came from. They try to tell me it's all a lie and it didn't exist. And they've got some good arguments. But at the end of the conversation, I ask them to explain my Uncle John. And they can't do it. They can't do it. Listen, it's the evidence. It's the evidence of a changed life. I'm going to tell you a story. One day I got a phone call from a frantic mother. I get about 10 of them a day. And, and, this, and this mom was, was uh, wanting me to help her son. Her son was being released from Webster County Jail in Marshville, Missouri. He had no place to go. It's 2013. She, she asked me if I could help him. She said he can't come home to our house because he's burned all the bridges. His, his stepdad won't let him be here. I said, if you can get him to the Victory Mission, if he can get his way to the Victory Mission, I'll help him. He'd have no ride. He'd have no money. But I know, the, I know the motivation of a dope fiend. And, and, and if, some, if you tell them there's a bag of dope and you ain't got no ride, no money, I bet you $100 you'll be there on the first thing smoking. Amen? <laughs> and, and so, and so he, he, I'm waiting for him at the Victory Mission. He found a ride. He gets out of jail, and I met him. Uh, he was standing there looked like a wet turkey. That's the best way I can describe him. He was, he was nervous. He was scared. He'd never been in a homeless shelter before. Uh, he, he was... I, he, he was waiting, he was waiting there, and uh, while I was waiting there with him and waiting for Mike to come, I got a phone, my phone rang, and it was his stepdad, and his stepdad said things like this. He gave me a hundred different reasons why I shouldn't trust him. He said he's a liar, he'll steal from you, he'll, 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 he's a, the best manipulator you ever met, you can't trust him as far as you can throw him, you better not take him in your, in your program. And the more they tried to get me not to help him, the more I wanted to give him a chance. Amen. I gave him a Bible. I got him a commentary on the, first, the book of 1 John. I took him to Sonic for a double cheeseburger. Amen. Gave him instructions. He was 100% obedient. This guy had been in prison three times. He was a three-time loser. He lost his family. He lived like a drug addict his whole life. He failed at everything he did. He entered into our discipleship program in 2013 and excelled. He came from a guy I had to address with a criminal mentality, with, with the, that street code that had to be broken out of him. He submitted. He excelled. Uh, he became a house leader. On probation, the judge overruled the, the, pub, uh, the, judge overruled the, uh, the parole officer, po probation officer, and allowed him to go on a mission trip to Mexico out of the country on probation, which is a miracle. He went to Mexico. He had a burden to be in missions. He had a burden to be in counseling. 
He entered Bible college from our men's program in 2014. He excelled. One day in Bible college, the president of, of BBC, Bible Baptist College, Mark Milioni, an ex-cop, walked up to Mike Costello, a three-time loser. And he said, Mike, I've noticed the impact you're making on our students. I notice how much you're encouraging them. You're changing our campus. What do I got to do to get you here full time to live on our campus all the time? He said, this is what I'll do. I'll give you a free dorm room. All you got to do is work one day a week for me for free. Mike Estelle moved into BBC campus in 2014. And today he still lives in the Bible College campus. Today, Mike Estelle, as I speak to you, is a 4.0 uh, Bible student at BBC. Mike Estelle is a, full, is, is a staff member at Marshfield Crossbridge Church. He's the, he's the freeway ministry coordinator. He has a great relationship with his son. He's been out of the country more now, going on mission trips. And his life is, a, is, is evidence of the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, how God is alive and God can change anybody, anywhere, anytime, from any place. <laughs> evidence. And here's what I'm telling you this for. You can dance around. You can make a bunch of noise. You can have all kinds of head knowledge. You can be emotional. You can put your hands in the air. You can do all those things, but all those things are not evidence of a real relationship with God. The false prophets did all those things, and so did the Hindu cults. But the evidence of the power of God comes from the changed life of a man or woman who is not the same person they were before because just like an 18 wheeler truck if it ran you over you would never be the same again and the Bible says that all who come to Jesus Christ he will make you a new creation the old things will pass away and behold all things are new that's what God does with your life he never leaves you like he found you he will change your world inside and out you can fake those things, but you can't fake a changed life, a consistent changed lifestyle. Jesus said this. Look what he said. Matthew 7, 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. Who is that? People who say they're Christians. They come to you as a Christian. Listen, they don't come to you with 666 on their forehead and wearing a Slayer t-shirt. They come to you with a Bible in their hand. They tell you about all the head knowledge they have. They try to impress you with their fancy theology. They look good. They pretend to love Jesus Christ, but they are wolves in sheep's clothing. What did Jesus say about them? He said, outwardly, they come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly, inside, they are ravenous wolves. How will I know those people? Look what he says in verse 16, Matthew 7, verse 16. You will recognize them by their fruit. What's fruit? What comes out of their life? Yeah. Watch them. Watch them. Watch them long enough. How do, I know, how do I know an apple tree from an orange tree? I don't know nothing about farming. I watch that joker long enough to see what comes off the limb. If an apple comes off of it, it's an apple tree. If oranges come off of it, it's an orange tree. If you keep going back to your vomit like a dog, you're a dog. If you give your life to Jesus Christ, your life will be changed. That's how I know. Don't tell me, show me. Let's see what's going on in your life, brother, sister. That's how I know. Praise God. Think about it. Jesus was saying if you pay attention long enough to a person, you will truly see what comes out of their life. And what comes out of their life is in their, in their life. If your mouth got filth coming out of it, it's because you got filth in your heart. Yeah. See, I don't like that preacher. I don't care what you like. Yeah. I'm preaching the truth. I'm not here to win a popularity contest, get claps or amens. I'm here to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you right now, if you live a filthy life, it's because you've got a filthy heart. You need to get your life right with Jesus Christ and live a righteous life in Jesus Christ and do the things that please God. That's how you know. What is coming from your life? There are many people in this room tonight that are like the false prophets. 
They say they have a relationship with God. They pray, they get excited, they worship, they make a bunch of noise, but inside their life there is no evidence of a relationship with Jesus Christ. Some of you in this room need to quit playing Christianity, quit playing church, and surrender your life to Jesus Christ and get saved from your sins and have a right relationship with the Lord. And the last thing Elijah challenged was their commitment. He challenged their commitment. Elijah challenges the people to commit. Look what verse 21 says. Verse 21. I'll read it. And Elijah came to all the people. What people? The bystanders. The people standing there riding the fence. Let's just say it like this. Elijah came to all the fence riders. And he said to them, how long? How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. And the people, listen to this, the people answered him, not a word. Not a word. The word falter, it means limp. It means dance. The idea in the Hebrew is that you go back and forth without stopping. And it's the same words used, it's the same word for dance that he used to describe the way the false prophets worshipped. He was kind of arrogant. A little little sarcastic, say that. He said, quit dancing like them between two opinions. Quit going to Baal and going to God and going to Baal and going to God and figure out where you stand. That's what Elijah was saying. See, imagine Elijah. He's standing all alone on Mount Carmel. He's looking at the false prophets. He sees King Ahab. And then there's a bunch of people standing in the middle. He's alone. He's alone with God. Let me tell you something tonight. There's going to be a lot of times if you really want to walk with God, well, you'll be walking right in the perfect will of God, and you'll be all alone, and nobody will be standing with you. Lots of people will think you're wrong. You stand with God. He's standing with God. 450 plus one over here with, with Baal. And then you got these people in the middle. And he's telling them, how long will you go back and forth till you make a commitment? How long will you dance? How long will you go between two opinions? He was telling them, make up your mind tonight. Make up your mind. Who are you following? One day you're following Baal. The next day you're following the God of the Bible. One day you act like a Canaanite. And one day you act like you're a Christian. Which one are you following? I should not have to see your My my Life God Walks on Water t-shirt to know you're a Christian. No more than you should have to see my wedding ring to know I'm married. You should know I'm married because of my love and devotion and commitment to my wife. And I should know you're a Christian 24 hours a day by your love and your commitment for your fellowship and the covenant you have with God Almighty. And tonight, listen to me. Some of you need to check your walk with God. Where are you at tonight? How long will you go between two opinions? At work, which opinion are you? Around lost people, which one are you standing on? Agreeing with their sin, laughing at their immoral jokes, listening to the, 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 the garbage on the radio that has nothing to do with God Almighty, spending more time on your Facebook than you spend in your Bible, spending more time on Sunday morning getting ready for church than you do reading your Bible all week long. Listen tonight, how long, how long will you falter? How long will you go between two opinions? Listen, you're missing out on the greatest blessing of your life because God could shake the gates of hell if you would get sold out to him and put your commitment with the Lord. So I'm challenging you tonight. How long? You can be mad at me. How long, brother? How long, sister? Your family's at stake. Your children are at stake. They need to see a dad who's committed to God. They need to see a mom who's committed to God. They need to wake up and hear you praying. They need to wake up and see you writing your Bible up and down, up and down, up and down instead of doing lines of cocaine and methamphetamines. How long? Be that person tonight. 
Surrender. Get sold out to Jesus Christ. What does it look like? Are your words seasoned with grace or seasoned with filth? Is your radio station playing Christian music or playing garbage of the world? Are you still impressed with your war stories? Are you ashamed of them? How long? How long will you falter? You say, preacher, you're a little legalistic. Holy roller. I'm not a holy roller. I love Jesus Christ and I want to please him and be sold out for him like I was for the devil because I know what God can do when somebody surrenders to Jesus Christ. That's the only reason I'm standing in front of you today. And I want to see that happen with your life. I look through the crowd and I see people who have no hope. I look through the crowd and I see people who have little potential in their own hearts but I'm telling you right now I know what God can do with somebody just like you I know God could change the world with if one of you would get surrendered if one of you would sell out if one of you would bring your junk to the altar and surrender to God Almighty God could use you and change your community change your family change your kids change your wife change your husband change your workplace if you would get sold out to God and surrender to him that's why I'm preaching to you like that that's why I'm spitting hopping clapping up and down that's why because I believe it and I won't be judged by how you respond I'll be judged by how I preach the gospel and I, tonight I'm gonna sleep good because I know I do my job I want to see you live in a blessed life you're not gonna get anything leaving living lukewarm with God you're not gonna live the blessed life that way Enter into the blessing by being all in tonight. Enter into the blessing by being all in. Listen, if you're riding a fence tonight with God, you're, back, you're, you're either backslidden or you have no relationship with God at all. I want you to hear from God. Wouldn't you like to hear from God? I want you to enjoy fellowship with God. I want to see you have a desire to obey God out of a pure love for Him. And a devotion to what he's done from saving you from your sins. There is no commitment in a shallow, there is no blessing from a shallow commitment to, for, to God. You're cheating yourself. You're the one losing. Somebody else is getting the blessing because guess what? God don't need you. He'll use somebody else to do it. Why? Because he's God. I want the blessing. I want the blessing. 2 Corinthians 6.14 do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership or fellowship has the righteous with the lawless? What fellowship has light with darkness? What accord is Christ with veil? What portion does a believer share with the portion of an unbeliever? What agreement did the temple of God have with the temple of idols? We are the temple of the living God. For God says, I will make my dwelling among them and walk in there among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. God is not held by brick and mortar. God is not held in fancy buildings. We don't need wood to meet with God. The only thing awesome and glorious enough to house the Spirit of God is God's creation, you and me. And you can experience that tonight. God in you, the Holy Spirit. K. Author says this, if you do not plan to live the Christian life totally committed to knowing your God and walking in obedience to, you, to Him, don't begin. Let me say that again. If you don't plan to live the Christian life totally committed to knowing your God and walking in obedience to Him, don't begin. For this is what Christianity is all about. It's the change of citizenship. It's the change of government. A change of allegiance. If you have no intentions of letting Christ rule your life, then forget Christianity because it's not for you. Say, preacher, that's pretty harsh. When Jesus said get in a boat and you didn't get in, what happened? See you later. He said nobody that puts their hand to the plow and looks back is worthy for the kingdom of God. Amen. See, this is serious. Commitment's serious. What would turn our cities and our families upside down is if some of you would get sold out to Jesus Christ like you did your drug addiction. I'm going to ask you something. How, how committed were you to the dope game? How committed were you to your street credit? How committed were you to your brothers and sisters you ran with? Your family. Your street family. What 
did you risk? Now let's put that next to your Christian walk. Does it match? Now you tell me that I'm legalistic because I ask you to be as committed to your God as you were your street life. That's foolishness. We should be more committed. We should be more willing. That's why God uses people like us, guys. Because we know what it's like to be lost and in the dark. And we appreciate the light with God. See, people are dying in the streets tonight. God has given us a chance to use our past in a powerful way. As a tool. And God can use you in your past. I'm going to ask you a question. Who's with me? Who's with me? Who's willing to stand up tonight? Who's willing to say, you know what, I want to be counted with God. I think some people in this room tonight need to come to this altar and give up some of that junk in your life. I think some of you in this room right now, you may be a Christian tonight, but you need to come to the altar and you need to say, you know what, I want to up my commitment. I want to be all in like Texas Hold'em. I want to be used to watch me help you, God, have a family restored. I want to see single moms get their kids back. I want to see people freed from the bondage of sin. I want to watch people turn this world upside down and be a little part of it tonight. Let me see that, Lord. Use me like an old tool in the shed that's broke down because it's the favorite tool of the shed. Amen. Uh, That's what I want from God. Praise the Lord. Elijah challenges the people. No one said a word. Elijah asked the question, what side are you on? It was quiet. Kind of like giving an altar call. And nobody says a word. Nobody responds. Every Saturday night at Freeway Ministry, there's lost people here who stand in their seats like this. You won't come. You're too worried about opinion. What do you say? How long will you dance between two opinions? Why are you worried about what somebody thinks you don't even know? Right? Can you see their faces? Elijah's questioning them. How long? How long will you dance between two opinions? How long will you be a Sunday morning Christian only? You know what I see? I see an enemy. I see an enemy who knows what side they're on. The prophets of Baal. I see God's man who knows what side he's on. And I see a bunch of spectators who can't decide. Tonight there's a bunch of spectators in this room who can't decide. You're riding a fence. You're not in the blessed life at all because you can't decide. I think tonight you need to get committed and get all in. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Imagine with every head down, every eye closed, Elijah finds an altar that's broken down. He rebuilds it. He dumps water all over it. He fills a trench full of water. And he puts himself in a position that only God can get him out of. And God responds with fire. In this place, there's people who put themselves in a situation that only God can get you out of. Your family is in a situation tonight that only God can get you out of. Your marriage is in a situation tonight that only God can get you out of. Your children are in a situation. Your past is caught up with you. Tonight, God has given you a chance to respond and get off the fence. Don't be like the crowd that answered not a word, but come out from the world and be separate. Jesus said this, Matthew 6, 24, and I'm going to finish. No one can serve two masters because you'll hate one and you'll love the other. You have to choose one. Father, I pray, God, that the message tonight would penetrate hearts. I pray tonight, before I give this altar call, that if there's lost people here, that they'll admit they're lost, they'll fall on the altar, and they'll ask, what can I do to be saved? Some in here may have thought they were Christians tonight, but through the message, they realize that they never have been changed. They have faith in church membership. They have faith in baptism, but God, baptism, church membership without a believing in the heart and confessing with the mouth mean nothing. Some in here need to repent of their sins.
Father, there's people in this room that need to up their commitment. They're not committed to you, Lord. They watch their friends read their Bibles and get excited, and they're not excited. It's just a book. Maybe there's sin in their life, Lord. Whatever it is, I pray that they'll make, make their way to the altar tonight. Say, you know what? God's burdened me tonight to up my commitment level. I need to start serving God. I need to start taking my family to church. I need to make a difference in my home. I pray, God, that you use this sermon for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me, please?